privilege to be here uh, today to share with you our experience in dealing with one of the major weeds we have now in the, in the U.S. So this is going to build up on what Dr. Uh, Oliver and Dr. Bob Nichols have already started discussing about. And so we're going to delve a little bit deeper into this issue. So um, Dr. Nichols had presented the definition of resistance as published by the Weed Science Society of America. And um, I would like to highlight a few points there just, just to refresh your memory. It is the ability to survive an application of a herbicide that used to kill them. So the key word here is that herbicide normally was lethal, and now it's not anymore. And so here's pigweed, of course. And uh, you may say, well, that meaning is, uh, that definition is very complicated. Uh, I'd say it's anything in my farm that I could no longer kill, and it would make a lot more of plants like it. And so that would work too. If, in this case, if this one plant is indeed resistant, then it will produce a lot more plants that are like the parent one. So the question is that um, Dr. Smith had assigned me to discuss today is um, how does resistance occur? So it goes like this. We'll get off pigweed for a while, and um, this is barnyard grass, and this is, uh, if you have a weedy mess like this, and this is one of Bob's plots in Lone Oak, and this is not to say that Bob's plots are messes. This is just his, <laughs> this is just his non-treated check, okay? So, so, well, if you spray this with a herbicide, you could end up with something like that. So we could say that is glyphosate, for example. In any case, you may kill all of them at one time, or some cases you may not. And so why are some of those weeds not killed by the application? Well, there could be many reasons. It could be because uh, the escaped weed was big when the application was made. It could be because the population was too thick, the coverage was not enough. And it could be because that particular one carries a genetic mutation that imparts a trait that allows it to survive that application. So which one? And so that's why we study these things. And so let's say, for example, in that field that you have that's covered with weeds, the frequency of occurrence of that particular special plant is one in a million. So this is a series of flats of pigweeds that we have screened, and in this particular population, none of them were that one. And so if we're talking about Palmer amaranth, and you look back to Dr. Oliver's presentation, how many mother plants do you think would it take for us to get to the millions individual? Two, three, one, so we'll, right? So it doesn't take very many mothers to get to that particular chance. So let's say, okay, this frequency can vary. So sometimes the frequency can be lower depending on the species. Sometimes it can be higher. In terms of pigweed, it could be higher because now we know that pigweed has the two major contributing factors for facilitating selection for resistance, and that is it has very high genetic diversity, and at the same time, it has very high fecundity, or the ability to produce a lot more seeds. So if we're talking about genetic diversity, it is usually indicated by how diverse the types of plants are that you see out there in your fields. And if you want to talk about that, you could only ask Dr. Jason Bond in his work with pigweeds, and he could tell you how many types of pigweeds there are that you could see out in the field. And these are just two examples. And, and what, one of the highlights of the data they have collected with Dr. Oliver is that this collection of plants from Arkansas and the southern U.S., would have leaf area ranging from 122 to 154 centimeters squares per gram. So that's just indicator of how different the sizes of their, these plants are, okay? And that's an indication of how diverse the genetic is. And we'll talk to that about later. So 
Well, um, we had a lot of weeds, right? And so we prayed for something that would make our lives easier. And so one of those years way back, we had glyphosate. And it was like um, manna from heaven. Hallelujah. We sprayed glyphosate and everything's gone. And so we have fields that are very clean like this, soybean, corn, cotton. Then, so when the car crop is going, we can go to take the kids to Disney World or go to uh, the Bahamas and then come back and harvest. And then it's still clean. And then after harvest, we can still afford to go hunt ducks and, and deer and all that because, because it's okay. The fields are clean. We have Roundup, right? We have glyphosate. Then we started seeing some that are left there at harvest. Well, we didn't pay too much attention, you know, because it's just, just one. And then, of course, uh, the next year, then you'll have these patches, like Dr. Oliver's patch that he showed you earlier. It could be bigger. And then if you talk to Dr. Northworthy, he would say that um, he had covered the experiment station in Fayetteville with resistant pigweed in a matter of three years. Well, I'm exaggerating on the whole station coverage part, but it's close. Um, <laughs> sorry, Chase. So, um, so what do we have now? Well, we collected more of the samples, surveyed the fields, and with the help of extension agents, Dr. Smith started this, and, and Bob, and all that. And we found one field in Arkansas of the 40 or so something that we collected samples from with the help of extension agents, one field that we had classified as a susceptible field. However, in this field, there were 10% of the plants that are showing moderate resistance to glyphosate already. So in the real sense, this is not even a 100% susceptible field anymore. Okay, and then the other fields. So here's the finger and uh, who said that? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so this is the Palmer finger. So in terms of Palmer, there's no such thing as thresholds anymore, right? And Dr. Smith coined that word, zero tolerance. So um, what are the resistant fields look like? So we, for example, we had found, we had like four fields here I've enumerated that are categorized as highly resistant in that field. Every single offspring about 4,000 of them that we would test in, in each field would be looking like this. They would not show any injury or, or hardly any injury with an application of glyphosate anymore. So that's why we have the problem. So, okay, the next question is, um, what are we doing really? So why, why are we getting this problem? What are we doing? So we are really just selecting. We're selecting for plants that are fit enough to survive whatever it is, whatever it is that we're doing to them. So in terms of... Um, one of, the, one, of the, one of the traits that we're selecting for is the ability of the plant to reduce damage or to avoid damage. And so that's when, that's when um, they would, we would be selecting for plants that are carrying the trait that allows them to reduce the amount of herbicide that reaches the target. So when we're talking about glyphosate, is, for example, the APSPS enzyme that's mentioned by Bob earlier. So this species... Um, rye grass, Johnson grass, and, and, and horseweed are able to tolerate glyphosate or resist glyphosate by reducing movement of the glyphosate in the plant. And there are other plants that do that to other herbicides as well. So that's one, one of the things we're selecting for. Another thing we're selecting for, or we have ended up selecting for, are plants that are able to sequester the herbicide into their vacuoles. Vacuoles are like the digestive organs of the cell. That's where they send toxins in order to survive a, a toxic uh, chemical. So they send that to the vacuole, and this is horseweed being able to do that to glyphosate so it's not killed by glyphosate. And then I have... Uh, uh, pardon me for showing this. This is one of the things that your kids are seeing in college and uh, give them nightmares. But... But anyway, um, for example, this is the APSPS enzyme we're talking about that, that is inhibited by glyphosate. And glyphosate binds in there into the binding site of this particular enzyme. 
what it's doing is it's replacing one of the substrate of that enzyme so it could, could not work properly. So that's how it's inhibiting that. So when we talk about mutation that we're selecting for, ALS is selecting for uh, mutations, that this is what we're talking about. It is change, any change here in this binding site that will prevent the herbicide from going in there. So that's how the plants um, avoid them. So in many cases, like in ryegrass and goosegrass and even in palmer for ALS, it's, 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 it's preventing the herbicide from binding into their target and so making the herbicide ineffective. That's what we're selecting for. Well, with palmer, it doesn't happen like that yet. So with palmer, it's probably starting with escaping the application because it's emerging continually. And, and glyphosate, for example, does not have residual activity in the soil. So the late emerging individuals will escape the application. It could start like that. And then the, the recent uh, finding is that the population in Georgia that, that Bob Nichols is talking about, it is able to have that particular enzyme, EPSPS, multiplied into many copies so that there will be more of it and then glyphosate cannot inhibit all of it. And so, for example, the resistant plants, this is number of copies down here at the bottom, it, it goes from 5 to 160-fold, many more copies of the, of, the, of the enzyme target. So it's kind of overcoming the herbicide activity by increasing the number of, number of targets. Okay. The other thing that we're doing with Palmer, and this is what we're seeing with the molecular work on, additional molecular work on the target, is that we are selecting for a more homogenized enzyme, a more uniform enzyme, meaning in this particular graph, here's, um, here's the, the red line is representing a resistant population from Mississippi County, Arkansas. The green line is representing the susceptible population from South Carolina, courtesy of Dr. Norsworthy. And this one has not been exposed to glyphosate. And so the peaks here are representing high diversity in the gene itself, in the target enzyme itself. So, so what it's showing, so for now ignore the blue line. The blue line is just measuring how different the two populations are. So for example, in this case here, um, the green line and the red line are very, diff are very far apart. So the blue line is also very tall, meaning the difference between the two populations are, are a lot, um, is a lot. So what this is showing is that with time, we have selected for a more homogeneous Palmer population. And, and the variation in this Palmer population in this target gene EPSPS is now low, lower. Whereas the variation in this target gene of the susceptible population is high. Now we say that the principle for being weedy is to maintain diversity so that whatever you throw at them, they can find a way to escape it. So we say, okay, so that's counterintuitive. Now we have a resistant population, it's more homogeneous, so now it's easy to kill it. Well, the thing is, it's not, because we have selected for something that is carrying other traits that is ably, enabling it to, to, to escape the application of herbicides. So our challenge now is to determine what are the alternative ways that we can overcome this particular population. Because although it's more homogeneous, it is a stronger population and it's more difficult to kill. And so that's now our challenge. And so that's why we, we need to look at these, um, these um, herbicide-resistant plants some more. So this is a problem in Arkansas, and, and, and Bob Nichols have shown this, and it's all over the delta and into the, Mississippi, um, into the Arkansas River Valley up here. And, um, and, and of course, how is it spread? Well, by seed and by pollen. So by seed, we know all the avenues, water, machinery, people, animals, and then pollen by wind and insects, right? So whatever we do to minimize all these, then we can minimize the spread. Well, this is where I'd say my pigweed can beat your pigweed. So here's, here's a female palmer, and Herb is probably more than six feet tall, and this palmer is twice as tall as he is, and this is just a seeded of it. And so if you have a large female, and this female happens to be already resistant, then it could spread out a million or so seeds. Uh, likewise, if it is... An equally large male, although Dr. Oliver said the males are smaller, but if you look at Dr. Oliver, he's not really that small. Um, but um, 
but the mail can also spread billions of pollen because the pollens are small. And so how far can each of these go? Well, the seed will depend on its carrier and the pollen will depend on its carrier. So, so that's all very variable. Now, we're forgetting also one thing that we may marginalize the male because they're small and cuddly and they don't really produce seed, but what we've found is that we've stumbled upon one male. We actually did this special project and stumbled upon one male that produced 27 seeds in, in by itself. And so when it comes, when push comes to shove and the, and the situation gets dire, the male can produce some seed. So uh, there's a lesson for us. And um, well, for some reason, we have some pigweeds growing in um, levees and ditches and around our, around our bins and all that, and they can be our seed bank contributors. So, so we normally don't pay attention to them, but they, they do spread seed. And then we collect them um, through the crop products that we take out of the field, and then all put them into one place where the cotton gins, for example, are. And then, and then we'll end up with a collection of weed seeds over there. And so this is from Dr. Northworthy's study showing that Palmer amaranth is one of the five uh, weeds that could occur in um, a collection of gin trash. So we're, we're um, spreading them that way. And the pollen, of course, um, right now uh, the Georgia group is studying how far pollen can go uh, as far as pigweed is concerned. And so... And so that is also another major carrier of where the, where the resistance trait could go. Okay, so a lot of avenues for spreading this trait. So what are, in summary, what are, what are we talking about? We're talking about um, resistance development or evolution because of what we do to the weeds. So what we do to them is w what we're going to end up seeing after, afterwards. And then um, the Palmer being so genetically and morphologically diverse that, that it's, it's, it's hard to, to target it with just one tool. So you have to use many different tools. And then um, as long as we continue to to target them or, or treat them with one tool, then, then they're able to adapt to that because, because of their diversity, correct? And then um, the resistance uh, would explode because of how tiny the seeds are, how numerous they are, and, and, and the way that we're also contributing to the selection um, process continually. So um, that is our challenge uh, this decade and in the next is how we're going to manage this in order, in order that we can um, solve the problem.